ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ASCRS Program Chair, Dr. Edward Holland. morning. Today we begin with another one of our ASCRS annual traditions, the Innovators Session. Before we hear the Charles D. Kelman Innovators Lecture delivered by Warren Hill, we will hear from five clinician scientists who will pre present their pioneering ideas. Dr. Farad Hafezi is a professor and chair of ophthalmology at the University of Geneva and a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the Dahini Eye Institute in Los Angeles, California. His presentation is titled, Role of Corneal Crosslinking in the Management of Infectious Keratitis. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, most of you will be familiar with the indication of crosslinking in ectatic disease, and it's been used in large parts of the world as an established method. Now, what we are much more enthusiastic about is this new indication of cross-linking, and we might wonder why can we use this technique for such various indications? Well, in fact, it's not a technique. It's a physiological principle that can be modified for various purposes. These are my financial disclosures. Now, looking at infectious keratitis, this represents a new indication for cross-linking. And having such a patient coming into our practice with a beginning ulcer, we know that the state of the art is medication, but we at the same time know about the diagnostic dilemma we often face. Is it bacterial? Or is it maybe fungal? Is it mixed? And the therapeutic dilemma. It's very cost-intensive. It's an expensive treatment, and we are also facing an increasing resistance to modern antibiotics. Now, taking all this together, often, even with maximal care, we might end up in a catastrophe. Looking at infectious keratitis at a global level, looking at developed countries, it is often related to contact lens wear. In the US, we have a registry that reports roughly 60,000 new cases of corneal ulcers per year. But the real problem is in emerging and developing countries. We have data for India, where we speak about an estimated 2 million cases every year. Minor corneal trauma, farm worker, no antibiotics, little income per day, cannot afford the antibiotics, and little to no access to the healthcare system. These people will lose their corneas and their eyes. So taking this all together, it is a global cause, a leading global cause of, of blindness. Five years ago, at the Crosslinking Congress, we defined the term CXL. We had a lot of terms before for the treatment of ectasia. We defined CXL, and last year, we took a consensus on, on giving this new application a new name, which is PAC CXL, just to make the difference between the treatment of infectious keratitis and keratoconus. And PAC CXL would stand for photoactivated chromophore or keratitis. It is not called photoactivated riboflavin because we will have new chromophores coming soon that are more efficient than riboflavin. Now I'll guide you through the, through the last six years of research. This is not new in medicine. The, the combination of energy rich light and a chromophore that takes the light and creates free radicals has been used to disinfect solutions and even to disinfect tissues for, for decades now. Transfusion medicine uses it in platelet concentrates to reduce the antimicrobial load, riboflavin and UVA. What is the proposed mechanisms of action is they, they are threefold. On one hand, the photoactivated chromophore might intercalate, so irreversibly bind to the nucleic acids of the pathogen and suppress replication. It might also create such a huge amount of oxidative stress at a time, so this disrupts the cell walls of pathogens. And this is an effect that has been known for quite some time. The cross-linking effect changes the three-dimensional aspect and structure of the collagen fibers so collagenases have a harder time to dock to the cleavage sites. 
laboratory results. The first two studies appeared in IOVS by two different groups, Scheer uh, and colleagues and Martins and colleagues. You see here a figure of the Scheer paper showing that this is the control. So you have a big amount uh, of untreated uh, MRSA uh, and uh, I think it's Pseudomonas in culture. And when you shine UV light on them, you might drastically reduce the number, 97% in 30 minutes. So what the researchers did there, they applied the Dresden protocol they had at the time for keratoconus. That was the proof of principle. In the same year, um, uh, we started in animals, and we looked at uh, corneal ulceration in animals, which is a, a major problem in cats, dogs, and horses, and the response without using antibiotics was quite amazing. But also in 2008, we published the first clinical results from Zurich around uh, the group of Theo Seiler, and we showed in a small case series of five patients that PAC-CXL is effective in therapy-resistant corneal ulcers. So the ethical uh, committee clearance we received is use the SUE method if you have tried any, any conventional method for four weeks with no success, we give you clearance. We did this in five cases, and all five cases improved. The most striking finding was done by Jess Mortensen three years later, who received a different kind of ethical committee clearance. They allowed him PAC CXL only, no antibiotics on one arm versus conventional treatment. And so in a series of 16 eyes treated with PAC CXL, he had results like this one. And there is not a single drop of fluoroquinolones or any other antibiotic on that cornea. This was light and riboflavin alone. So this is, this is what makes us so enthusiastic about this method. We then started another study between uh, Geneva and Cairo. And uh, again, we had clearance for very far advanced ulcers and impending perforation. And even in this uh, subpopulation, this was a mixed infection, I think, between Pseudomonas and uh, Aspergillus. Even in impending perforation cases, the cornea would calm down and scar close the epithelium within two weeks, 20 days. Here's another case. As you can see, this is right before, and this is one day after cross-linking, PAC-CXL. You have an increased amount of, of dead bacteria and debris, so inflammation is higher one day after and then goes down. This is similar to what we see in internal medicine and the treatment of tuberculosis, for example, and it's called the gerish herxheimer reaction. You kill a lot of pathogen at the same time, by the next day, you will have an increased inflammation, and then it calms down. What will the future bring? If we look at the current state and the unmet needs, then we shouldn't look at developed countries only. On a global level, this treatment has shown its proof of principle, but it's expensive. It's been performed in operating theaters. It is slow. The devices are bulky. There is no security mechanism at hand, so it's performed by specialists. To be effective on a global level, we need to make it inexpensive, take it into the consultation room, make it fast, make it inexpensive, implement security mechanisms, and give it into the hands. That's the, that's the dream of the general ophthalmologist. And not treat the end stage of an ulcer, treat the infiltrate, treat the early, early stages of the disease. So our research group in Geneva has been focusing on these three aspects in the past four years. Shorten the treatment time. We are now at 120 seconds to kill bacteria and fungi efficiently. We are working in a spin-off company of the university on a, on a small device, and we have implemented security mechanisms. Shorten treatment time. You see here three different regimens. 3 milliwatts for 30 minutes, 9 milliwatts for 10, 18 milliwatts for 5. The blue columns are the controls, so bacterial growth and here, where there is an absence of a column, that's the effect of PAC-CXL in vitro. So we can kill 99.9% .9 of MRSA in five minutes here with riboflavin and with a new chromophore that I cannot reveal yet, we do the same thing in 120 seconds in, in vitro. The second aspect would be to take this out of the operating theater. Why would I take a septic patient into a sterile environment, kill 99% of uh, the pathogen within two minutes, and then take him out again? So what is the most basic equipment every ophthalmologist has? 
The slit lamp is defining our profession. And the slit lamp has a Goldman tonometer. So why don't we take off the Goldman and have a device that is replacing the Goldman, you do the treatment at the slit lamp. And this is what we are currently working on. It's a machine that will deliver all the intensities that, that currently can be used for keratoconus treatment, but also for infectious keratitis treatment. And it has a, a sterile tip that can be replaced. This tip is important because it will allow us to either, it contains a lens system, so this tip will either allow us to perform a keratoconus treatment with more energy in the periphery of the cornea for ectatic disease, or with an adapted irradiation profile that is optimized for infectious treatment. And if we were to give this into the hands of the general ophthalmologist, we need a security mechanism. And this is the security mechanism. It is a real-time measurement of the fluorescence of the chromophore to ensure that there is proper saturation of the chromophore prior to treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.